1. You will shortly hear a conversation between a prospective tenant calling to know about some vacant accommodation. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Hello? Yes, hello. My name is Roger Peters, and I'm looking for an apartment. I saw your ad in the paper about a vacant flat and would like to inquire about it. Ah, OK. Yes, I got that ad published. I do have a vacant flat, and it is still available. Ah, then I do have the right number. Could you please tell me more about the flat? From the ad in the paper, it sounds nice. I'm in dire need of a place to shift to. Why are you looking for a place to shift? There are several reasons why I'm looking to move, but most of all, I want to lower my costs and also move to a place closer to my workplace. The flat you are offering meets the criteria. I see. Where are you living now? And how much are you paying for rent? I'm currently living on the East End, off Highland Boulevard. I live in a two-bedroom flat, and I'm paying $800 a month, plus utilities. It's in that new tower, you know, Brannan Complex. Oh yes, that is an exclusive area. Indeed it is. Can I have a little more information about the flat you offer? What would you like to know? Well, how spacious is it? Well, it's big enough to accommodate a family of four to five members. It has a living room, two bedrooms, dining room, kitchen, washroom, and a spacious balcony. Well, there are three of us in my family, and that sounds like it would suit us nicely. Is it fully furnished? What about utilities? Yes, it's fully furnished, and utilities included are water, gas, and electricity. You will have to arrange for your own landline for telephone. Nice. And what is the precise location of the building it is housed in? It's in Flayers Tower. It's a fairly new building, built two to three years back. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. Oh, that sounds great. How much is the rent? The rent is $550 per month. Oh, that is going to burn a hole in my pocket. Well, as I said, it is fully furnished and includes all the utilities. Yes, you did say that. Now, if you do pay in advance, say six months in advance, which will be $3,300, you'll get a discount of 5% off the total rent. So, this means you want to sign an agreement for six months? I would prefer this. But you do have the option to pay rent every month. So, the choice is yours. Well... It would be difficult for me to fork out six months' rent in advance. I'd much rather go for month-to-month -month rent. What about parking? Parking is available next to the entrance. And is this a secured parking? I mean, 
Is there security present? Yes, of course. There is a security guard 24 hours a day at the entrance. Is there anything else you would like to know? Yes. How far is it from the shopping mall? And is there a park nearby for the children to play? Well, there is a park and playground on the complex, which the children can play in. Unfortunately, there is no large mall nearby. The nearest school is three kilometer away, but they do have a pickup. There is a fair number of stores nearby for day-to-day -day shopping. And when does this flat get ready to shift? Well, after you fill out the application and pass the credit and background check, you could move in about a week. Ah, OK. Is there anything else? Yes, you do need to pay the first month's rent and a security amount of $500. Why is there a security deposit? Mainly to ensure that you do not leave the apartment in a dilapidated condition. Is it refundable? Only if you leave the apartment clean and in good shape. When can I come by to view the flat and make the arrangements? We can meet tomorrow. Very well. I'll come then. Thank you. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. Listen to a presentation on the five most frequently visited museums of Australia. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 15. Good evening and thank you Mr. Livingstone for inviting me to speak before you all. To all of you, thank you for being here. As you know, my name is Dr. Harold Kramer. I'm the Chief of Operations for the Pacific Museum of Natural History, located here in Queensland. I will be discussing the five most frequently visited museums of Australia. As you all know, a museum is an institution that houses and showcases collections of artifacts and relics which are of scientific, artistic, cultural, or historic value and make valuable displays and presentations. Not only that, museums are places that provide facilities for study, whether it's in the realm of science, history, aesthetics, or a combination of all three. The artifacts, models, displays, and other presentations are open for viewing by people through exhibitions. It is a general notion that museums are visited only by scholars or students. This notion is unfortunate and archaic because it springs from the misconception that museums are dreary and drab places. On the contrary, museums can be quite fascinating and intriguing places. I think you'll be very much surprised to learn how many people visit these institutions annually. Among these visitors, you will of course find scholars, students, and tourists. But you will find many, many other people who visit. Often you'll find whole families showing up at a museum with the parents explaining that they bring their children to learn about the world around them or about things from the past. Others come because by visiting they learn about new things and have great fun-filled experiences. It really is a pleasure to see all these people visit. It makes the job of working in a museum very fulfilling. Before you hear the rest of the talk you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Tonight, I'm going to tell you about the top five museums of Australia. The museums that I'm going to speak about are the National Museum of Australia, Museum of Contemporary Art, Australian National Maritime Museum, National Sports Museum, and the National Gallery. After I describe these museums, I will reveal how many have visited them during the summer months this year. The number will astound you. We'll begin with the National Museum. It was established in 1980 and officially opened in Canberra. It preserves the social history of the Aborigines and traces the events that have shaped the nation through the ages. It houses the world's largest collection of Aboriginal bark paintings and stone tools and is a delight to archaeologists and those interested in Aboriginal culture. The Museum of Contemporary Art was founded in 1996 and was created as a permanent institution for contemporary art. It is located in Sydney and is evolving in exhibiting, interpreting, and collecting contemporary art from all over Australia and the world. It is a hub for lovers of modern art. The Australian National Maritime Museum is located in Sydney and is visited for its display of ships and submarines that are often docked in the harbour in front of the museum. It allows visitors to go aboard these vessels and experience life at sea. It also displays items relating to Australia's dependence on the oceans and has been open to the public since 1973. The National Sports Museum is an amazing museum inside the Melbourne Cricket Grounds. As the name suggests, it keeps a record of the sporting stories from its early beginnings to present times. Sporting heroes, their achievements, and other memorable sporting moments find a place here. It was founded in 1969 and includes the Australian Cricket Hall of Fame, the Australian Racing Museum, and the Sport Australia Hall of Fame. It also features a large interactive area that is popular with all ages. The National Gallery, located in Perth, is by far the most famous gallery in all of Australia. It has extensive displays of Western art, beginning from medieval times and stretching to modern art. It also features Eastern art, mostly in the form of traditional art from South and East Asia, as well as international modern art. Over the one century of its existence, it has collected and displayed sculptures, paintings, murals, relics, and lots more. Over the summer this year, these museums witnessed record numbers of visitors. The National Museum alone received 10,000 visitors. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will now hear a conversation between a university professor and a student about the essential characteristics and differentiating features of a literary review. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello. Good morning, Anna. How are you, and how is that literary review coming along? Are you still working on it? Hello, sir. I'm doing okay. Thank you for asking. Yes, I'm still working on it, and that's why I'm here. I'd like to talk to you about it. I'm drawing a blank on how to get started. I was, um, well, maybe you could suggest something to get me going. Certainly. You do know that you must write a literary review. Have you ever written one, and do you have any idea on how you plan to go about it? 
Well, I know it's a literary review, but I don't really know what it really is or how to go about it. I've written one before. I would imagine that, well, you take a book such as a novel or a book of poetry, settle into an easy chair, and then read it. Once you've finished it, you either give it thumbs up or thumbs down. Isn't that how a literary review is done, right? Actually, no, that's not how it's done, and that's just too simple. Also, that doesn't really mean anything. If you really like a book or dislike it, you should be able to state why you like or dislike it. You might also find that there are parts of a book that you like, but overall you might dislike it, and vice versa. Now, the nature of a literature review refers to any collection of materials on a particular topic, and not necessarily the great literary texts of the world. Now, what am I talking about here? Literature in and of itself could be anything from a set of government pamphlets on the colonial methods of the British in Africa to scholarly articles on the treatment of a torn ligament. It could also entail fiction, prose, or anything in between. Furthermore, when you write a review, it does not mean that your reader wants you to give your personal opinion on whether or not you like the book or text. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen to the second part of the discussion and answer questions 26 to 30. So what is a literary review? A literature review discusses published information in a particular subject area and sometimes information of a particular subject area within a certain time period. A literature review can be just a simple summary of the source but it usually has an organizational pattern and combines both summary and synthesis. Okay, but how is a literature review different from an academic research paper? The main focus of an academic research paper is to develop a new argument. A research paper will contain a literature review as one of its parts. In a research paper, you use the literature as a foundation and as support for a new insight that you might contribute. The focus of a literature review, however, is to summarize and synthesize the arguments and ideas of others without adding your own contributions. Okay, I see. I wonder about the purpose of writing a literature review. I'm glad you brought that up because it's exactly what I wanted to talk about next. You see, literature reviews provide you with a handy guide to a particular topic. If you have limited time to conduct research, Literature reviews can give you an overview or act as a stepping stone. For professionals, they are useful reports that keep them up to date with what is current in their field. For scholars, the depth and breadth of the literature review emphasizes the credibility of the writer in his or her field. Literature reviews also provide a solid background for a research paper's investigation. Comprehensive knowledge of the literature of the field is essential to most research papers. But I'm just curious about who writes these. Literature reviews are written occasionally in the humanities, but mostly in the sciences and social sciences. Within experiments and lab reports, they constitute a section of the paper. Sometimes a literature review is written as a paper in itself. Well, I think it is now going to be easier for me to write the review. Good. But don't forget that you have to submit it by the end of the class on Monday. I'll be sure to do that. Thank you for your help. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. Now listen to part of a classroom lecture on geographical and related characteristics of Greece and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good morning, students. Today, we're going to continue our discussion of European countries. As you know, we've already covered the countries from Northern and Central Europe, as well as most of the ones that lie along the Mediterranean. Today, I'm going to talk about Greece. As you know, it is an ancient birthplace of one of the most predominant civilizations to exercise early influence. On much of the Western world now, when you think of Greece, you think of its antiquity and ancient civilization. You think of Alexander the Great, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, and all the great philosophers. You think of the Trojan War, the ancient Greek gods, and everything in between. Out of all the European countries we have discussed, Greece is perhaps the richest country. In terms of culture and contributions to our modern society, more so than the Romans, for the Romans took much of what was Greek and repainted in a Roman fashion. Greece has been known since ancient times and is located in southern Europe, specifically southeastern Europe. Athens is the capital of this country, and it is located in the southwest. Of the mainland, it is also, of course, one of Greece's largest cities. Greece is situated at the intersection of three continents: Europe, Western Asia, and Africa. It is bordered by Albania in the northwest, Macedonia and Bulgaria to the north, and Turkey to the northeast. The Aegean Sea surrounds the east of the mainland. The Ionian Sea. Is to the west. The Mediterranean Sea is to the south, and the Adriatic lies in the northwest. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions. Greece has the largest coastline of all the countries of Europe, and is the eleventh longest in the world, because of its large number of islands. Greece contains a mountainous peninsula mainland with a land boundary of one thousand one hundred sixty-eight kilometers. Greece has many islands, totaling around six thousand. There are two hundred and thirty that are inhabited. The climate of Greece is classified into three types: Mediterranean, Alpine, and Temperate. The temperatures in the Mediterranean rarely reach extremes, and at times there is sparse snowfall in some areas. The temperature climate is mainly marked by cold, damp winters and hot, dry summers. One of the most prominent geographical features of Greece. Is the mountain range? Greece is among a small number of countries that feature a large number of mountains within their territories. Mount Olympus is the highest peak, and has been believed to be the abode of the twelve Olympian gods of ancient Greece. It is the fourth tallest peak in Europe and rises approximately three thousand meters above sea level. The Pindus mountain range runs from the northwest to southeast, and is further extended to the Peloponnese range. The Pindus range also runs under water and crosses the Aegean Sea. 
to form the Aegean Islands. The largest of these islands, the island of Crete, is controlled by Greece. Greece also has a large number of islands and islets that lie in the Aegean Sea. The largest island, Crete, extends 250 kilometers from east to west and is 55 kilometers in width at its widest point. It is approximately 150 kilometers south of mainland Greece. The Ionian Islands are a different cluster of seven different islands, six of which lie off the western coast. The seventh lies off the southern tip of the Peloponnesian Mountains. The Aegean Islands fill the Aegean Sea in an area that spans between mainland Greece to the west and north, Anatolia to the east and Crete to the south. While much of the climate of Greece is predominantly Mediterranean, the Pindus mountain range divides the country so that the climate is much wetter in the west and drier and windier in the east, particularly during the summers. The northern areas have a transitional climate, while other areas have an alpine climate. The average annual temperature varies between 10 to 19.7 degrees Celsius. The winds in Greece are colloquially known as the Meltimi, but they are better known by the name Etisians. These are prominent in the Greek mainland from the midsummers to early winter. They keep the temperatures on the islands of the Aegean lower than those in the Ionian Sea. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Thank you.